everyone, and welcome to My Brain is a Wonderland, Season 2. This is the podcast for neurodivergent women and the people who love them. Today, you are here with your host, Emily, that's me, and we are going to be talking about the dreaded task of cleaning. Now, I know that for most people, cleaning is not something that they enjoy, whether you're neurotypical, neurodivergent, whatever you are. I don't think for most people, cleaning is something that people find easy or um, brings pleasure to their life, except maybe for the outcome that you have a clean and organized space after. I think there's definitely people who do get joy from it. Maybe if you have OCD, that's a really intense feeling of needing and wanting to have a clean and organized space. And I'm sure there's neurotypical people who like the act of cleaning. They like to do these types of activities. I don't even know how to describe them. I myself have always struggled with cleaning, maintaining a home, staying organized, and have always struggled to find the motivation to do it and to get out of that cycle of being surrounded by mess and disorganization and dirt, which stresses you out so you know you should clean it, but you find it difficult to get up off the couch and do that, even though you know the outcome at the end will be beneficial for you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience with this over my life, because it has been an issue over my entire life from childhood. And then I'm going to talk about some tips that I've been using lately as an adult that have actually helped me I don't want to say enjoy doing dishes, but I do them, I get them done, and it's not a huge, extensive task like it used to be in my mental space. So when I was a kid, I always had issues with cleaning up, tidying up, and I think there are a lot of different reasons why. For sure, I would get distracted. I remember a specific time I had one of those beds, you know, that had a desk underneath and a table that you would push in underneath this kind of lofted bed. And I would throw a bunch of stuff in there, right? Just like newspapers, magazines, old school work, things like that. And one day my mom asked me to clean it. And what ended up happening is as I'm going through the stuff, I just start reading it, right? I get distracted. So I would start trying to clean up these papers and I'd end up looking at them. And something that would take 30 minutes would turn into two, three hours of me kind of zoned out looking at this stuff. And that didn't lead anywhere productive. It just ended with me surrounded by newspapers and magazines and different pieces of work that weren't put anywhere. I would also often just get bored in a task. So if there wasn't something I could read or engage with, like I was cleaning up pieces of paper, then I would get so bored and get very slow and negate my responsibilities. So one of my only cleaning tasks as a child was to dust. So I would spray the dust sprayer around and dust the counters and the TV, and I did not enjoy it, but it was the one tolerable thing, I think, because maybe it was quick compared to other things that would have to be cleaned. But I would lose focus, I'd go very slowly, and it would take a lot longer than it needed to take. Another thing that was very common is I would eat food in the living room or in my bedroom or in a certain space, and those plates would end up, you know, behind a couch, just sitting there for days, weeks. It was kind of a running joke in my family that you could always find a plate by the big chair that I would sit in, and it would be right down on the floor beside the chair against the wall, and there was always one there. And I think with that, that's kind of an out of sight, out of mind thing. So I wouldn't have the motivation to get up and go take it to the kitchen at that time, or to clean it, because I most certainly didn't want to do that. And so I would put it down by the chair, and then completely forget about it, forget that it was there, And then it would start building up. I would add plates to it until my mom would grab them and move them to the kitchen and clean them in a very frustrated, angry way. And that was very common going into teenagehood and adulthood. I was traveling when I was around 18, living in an apartment with a bunch of people I didn't know, and I had to share a room. 
This was in Asia, so there were lots of needs for water bottles because it was so hot. And if you could look at my room by the end of the few months I was living there, it was covered in empty water bottles. And I think this is a common thing that you see online all the time, is that we leave cups around, we leave bottles half drunk, just sitting around. And I think that is a out of sight, out of mind thing. You put it down, you forget it's there, and then you forget to clean it up. And then it becomes so overwhelming because there's so many bottles that you don't even know where to begin. And maybe it sounds easy, like, oh, just pick them up. The issue with people, particularly with ADHD, is that we lack in dopamine. And dopamine is one of those things that helps motivate you. It's actually something that helps you form habits. And habits are things that you don't need to think about, right? So when you're just walking to your bedroom at night, and you go straight to the bathroom and pick up a toothbrush, that's a habit. You didn't have to initiate it in your brain. The thing with ADHD people is, is that you have to initiate every task. You have to think about it. You have to say, I need to brush my teeth. Okay, I'm going to go brush my teeth. Where's the toothbrush? Where's the toothpaste? Now I'm brushing my teeth. Which is mentally exhausting on all of us who have to live with this condition. And a lot of people don't understand how habits work who are neurotypical because they just work, they just happen. And so having to initiate this idea of cleaning up instead of just it's automatic that something you have that's dirty you now take to the kitchen, it's very difficult to do. The other thing regarding cleaning is the sensory issues that come from engaging with a lot of the tasks that need to be done. For example, I have always had issues with being wet when I'm supposed to be dry. I don't know if that sounds absolutely bizarre or if everyone listening knows exactly what I'm saying. But basically, if I am washing a floor and I'm wearing socks, or even if my feet are bare and my feet get wet, the soles of my feet, it is absolutely sensorily unbearable. I have to wear shoes, which can sometimes be an issue because I'm not always planning the best when I'm cleaning a floor, right? You should go from back to front so you're coming out of the room while you clean so you don't have to walk over the wet floor. And if you're wearing shoes, you're going to dirty up the wet part of the floor if you step in the wrong place. Another issue is doing dishes. I cannot stand my hands being wet and touching wet food. So if I come in contact with, you know, bread that's been soaking, I mean, I literally just heaved. It's it's just awful. And so one of the things I use, which can also be a bit of a sensory nightmare, is um, dish gloves, rubber gloves. That has helped a little bit. But the worst thing, oh my god, the worst thing is wearing dish washing gloves, the rubber gloves. And you stick your hand into, say, a sink full of water with food in it and dirty dishes and it goes too far up your wrist, and the water floods into your gloves. Like, oh my god, the sensory issues I have from doing dishes, honestly. It's taken me so long to realize that, because I thought I was just lazy. I thought I was lazy, avoidant, just didn't have the knack for it, didn't have the stuff, you know, I wasn't one of those rough and ready, I like to clean and get dirty kind of people. I was always seen as a little bit delicate, just a little bit delicate and a little bit above it all, you know, that I thought, well, I'm too good for this, which I never thought that, but people would look at me that way. Um, I didn't like to be dirty on my clothes when I didn't expect to be. If I'm going to go outside and get dirty, I want to wear certain things. I remember being in a car with my husband and sister-in-law, and we were taking her dogs to the park, and I was in the back with the dogs and one of them jumped on my lap and got mud on my pants just a little bit I mean I'm not talking just a little dusty footprint and I exclaimed you know oh there's mud on my pants and I remember my sister-in-law her tone of voice and what she said you could tell she was kind of taken aback that it's not that big of a deal you knew we were going to the park why didn't you dress appropriately and it's really not about that. I just, being unexpectedly wet or dirty really sends me. And it's a sensory issue and an unexpected issue, um, which I think neurodivergent people deal with a lot. 
And then another thing which I think is really interesting, and I'd love to hear if other people have had this realization or issue, but my method of organization is absolutely dumpster fire. So if you go into my cabinets, and my husband has mentioned this, if you go into my kitchen cabinets, which I've quote unquote organized, there doesn't seem to be a what a neurotypical person would say is a logical method to the organization. So for example, I have all of my baking things in one cupboard, which seems logical, right? So flour, sugar, baking powder, baking soda, different things like that. But then I'll also have my pasta, my rice, my peanut butter and jam go in the same cupboard. And as I'm saying it, I think the pasta and rice belong there because they're dry and kind of remind me of flour or they're made from flour. I feel, you know, pasta is, rice is, and it's a grain, but I kind of have this connection there. And then the peanut butter and jam go in there because you use them in baked goods. But when you're actually looking for things, I, I think to neurotypicals, this makes absolutely no sense. Another thing that I did, which I thought I was doing my husband and I an absolute service, but apparently I'm a psychopath, I got a label maker, and this is actually a good thing. If you um, are struggling with remembering where things are, get a label maker, put labels on your cupboards in your kitchen. It helps guests as well, but it helps you. I would always forget where things are, even when I've been living in a space for a long time. And if you have moved to a new space, putting labels helps because you have to reorganize the whole thing. But I got a label maker and the whole plan was to get like six to eight tubs for our utility closet where all different things would be like tape, string, screwdrivers, nails, things like that. And I got these tubs and I labeled them up and put everything in there. And over the next few weeks, I slowly realized that my method of organization just didn't make sense to anyone else. The way I connect things together are not how neurotypicals connect them. I think they connect them like how they're used. And I think more of in like a cerebral, what do they mean way. So I think my husband would expect screwdriver, uh, screwdriver to be with the nails, but I put like the nails and the screws in with the tape because they're all attachments and adhesives, if that makes sense. You know, you screw things in, you nail things in and you tape things up. So they all went together. But then my husband's looking for screws and nails with the hammer and the screwdriver, but they're not there. So I'd love to hear from other people if you have this kind of wackadoo way of organizing that makes absolute sense to you. Like, duh, that goes with that, but it makes no sense to anyone else. And I think that's an issue because maybe sometimes when you're engaging with others in your home in terms of organization and cleanliness, it doesn't match up and it doesn't make any sense to anyone but you. And that doesn't help everybody. The saving grace is that I labeled everything. So I told my husband, look, it's labeled. However wackadoo it is, at least the tubs are labeled. So just look at the labels if you're looking for something. Now, with regards to what has been working for me, these are things that I, some of them I collected from different uh, online resources and other things I just kind of realized helped me. One of the things that I did growing up with my mom that I now realize is something that's really necessary sometimes and really does help me is body doubling. My mom, I think, does have ADHD or is neurodivergent in some way, is undiagnosed. And so we grew up together, just me and my mom in my home. And we would body double all the time. So when I would cook or she would cook, one of us would sit in the kitchen and the other person didn't ask the other person to sit in the kitchen with them. We just did it naturally and enjoyed that experience. And now I'm realizing that it's a body doubling situation. And what body doubling is, is that if you are neurodivergent and you need to be motivated to do something, cleaning, cooking, whatever, studying, it helps to have just a person in the room with you while they do something or just sitting there hanging out. 
So if I'm cooking, I like my husband to be in the room. He could be on his laptop in the room, in the kitchen. He could be doing whatever. He could be doing dishes. I love it when he does that. He does dishes, I cook, and we're just in the room together. And it helps uh, push the motivation. It helps keep the energy going, I think, of having someone else there. And uh, just generally is a good motivation tool. And I've done that my whole life, like I said, but I didn't realize that I was doing that until I started looking into ADHD and things to help. And I was like, oh, body doubling. Yeah, that's a thing. And I've done it and I love it. Another thing that does very well for me, and I've read this online also just anecdotally, but I always try to do something as soon as I get home. So if I get home from work, I'm in my work clothes, I've got my shoes on. Instead of sitting down on the couch, I'll stay up and I've told myself that day, this is what I'm going to do when I get home. So it's not a surprise. I'm not getting home and going, oh, I have to do this. I'm going, you are going to do this. And I'll get home and I'll do dishes or I'll work out. I'll do something I know I'm supposed to do. I'll do it right away. And I'm telling you, it is one of the best ways to do it. You're already active. I think one of the things that maybe is beneficial to me is a lot of the times I take the bus home from work, I don't drive. And so I've walked from the bus stop to my home. So I'm in this active energy space. And I'm sure a lot of people listening, especially if you're in the US, you actually drive home from work. And God knows how long that commute is. It could be 10 minutes, could be 90 minutes, right? And I think that might be a little more difficult because you've sat down. And you've sat down in the car and now you're getting up to go inside and then you have to stay up. But if you are walking home or maybe biking home, taking the bus and then walking, I think it's a lot easier to just go into the activity right away and just get it done. And I want to say I use a lot of these in conjunction. So if I just, I'm going to tell you what the next one is, but if I just said, oh, I'm just going to do it when I get home, that's still very difficult. What I'll do in conjunction with that is I'll play usually a podcast. So that's almost like another form of body doubling, right? Is I have a podcast on where people are talking and I feel like there's someone else in the room. They're timed. You can pick a podcast that's 20 minutes. You can pick a podcast that's 90 minutes. And I'll put my favorite on while I'm in the kitchen doing dishes or working out on an elliptical or I have a treadmill and I'll put my phone on with a podcast or a TV show or something. And it's like I'm being body doubled. There's also a timing aspect. so. I wouldn't go past one podcast, really, unless I was really into it or unless the podcast was only 10 minutes long or something. But that has really helped me. And there's so many podcasts out there. Hello, I'm here. So if I'm here, trust me, there's thousands out there that you could be listening to. And the last thing that I have found has been really successful for me is using a timer. And that has actually helped with motivation, is I'm laying on the couch thinking there's literally, you know, five pans that are dirty, dishes, you know, 20 dishes, all the cutlery, all of the stuff. And um, I find it hard to get off the couch and do it. But if I say, here's what I'm going to do, I'm going to set a timer for 10 minutes And you can play a podcast during that time or have music or have a body double in the room, whatever. Keep your shoes on from work, whatever. But you say, I'm going to set the timer for 10 minutes. You could set it for five minutes, two minutes, right? At the end of those however many minutes, you're going to stop. So for example, with doing dishes, you're going to do as many dishes as you can in two, five, 10 minutes, however many minutes you choose. And then at the end of that, you're going to stop and you're either going to be done or you're going to move to another task. So you might say, I'll do dishes for five minutes, I'll vacuum for five minutes, and then I'll be done. And I'm telling you, if you do that every day or every other day, just say, I'm going to do cleaning for five to 10 minutes, your house will be so much cleaner and more organized. And I think we, as neurodivergent people, generally are um, into rewards, right? We like to be rewarded or we like a deadline and things like that. So using a timer is very helpful. And you know, there's an end. You know, when I would start doing dishes in the past, I'd be like, my hands are wrinkly from being in water. I'm touching goo. 
I'm in hell, this is boring, and how much longer do I have to do this? We'll just do dishes for five to ten minutes. Vacuum for five to ten minutes. I'm telling you, my house is uh, 1,200 square feet-ish, 13 maybe. I could do all the vacuuming in about ten minutes, in the entire house. Um, Then I could Swiffer for five to ten minutes. You know, you'd be surprised how much you can get done especially if you have the ADHD energy going, if you just put it on a timer. And that has been one of the most successful things I've ever chosen to do in terms of motivating myself. So if you're struggling with this issue, I recommend trying at least one of the things I mentioned, right? Pick a podcast that you love or you think you will love and play it. And do that while you are doing your task. Ask your child, husband, wife, father, mother, aunt, friend, neighbor to sit in the room with you or do the thing they need to do while you're doing the thing. You know, how many times are you in the kitchen doing dishes and someone else has work to do from work or their extracurricular activity and they're doing it in another room? Have them do it in the kitchen with you. Or say to your spouse or your child or whoever you live with, your roommates, can we agree every Tuesday at 6 p.m. we do 10 minutes of cleaning together? And that, I mean, I'm telling you, two people doing 10 minutes of cleaning, you'd be surprised how much you would get done. Try the timer, which every cell phone has that. If you are, you know, has a stopwatch, has a timer function. And see how you like that. See if it works for you. And try body doubling. If you're struggling with a lack of people around you, maybe you don't live with roommates, maybe your family isn't close by, you don't have many friends, maybe you don't have a spouse. I don't have any friends, so don't be ashamed about that, trust me. Use the timer. That is so helpful to me when I'm alone, is to use that timer and really motivate me, and know there's an end point. I'm not going to be doing dishes for an hour. I'm going to do it for five to ten minutes. And the last thing is don't forget, if you commit in the morning when you go to work and say, when I get home tonight, as soon as I get home, I'm going to keep my shoes on, and I'm going to work out. I'm going to clear the yard. I'm going to do the dishes. I'm going to clean the floor. You can tell, I keep mentioning dishes. It's clearly my issue that I've had my entire life. So, but you got to do dishes, right? Dishes accumulate every day because we're humans who eat freaking food and you can't eat off a paper towel every day. I mean, sometimes I eat off a paper towel if it's a sandwich or something, but you really cannot. And I've tried to do the paper plates thing. That's another thing. Don't feel ashamed about that. If you have an issue with dishes, Get some paper plates, man, and throw them away. The What I would recommend is you don't get the plates that have a sheen coating on it. You get the paper, paper ones. And of course, wet food is going to soak through that pretty quickly. But if you have ADHD, you're not going to have issues with eating quickly. Am I right? But what you can do with those plates, if you're worried about the environment, which I am, I really feel issues with getting paper plates. I cannot buy plastic cutlery. I just cannot. Is that if you get the true paper ones and have food on it, you can compost them. So get a composter for your yard and just rip up the paper plates that are dirty and throw them in your composter and you feel a lot better about what you're doing. So there's my tips for cleaning, for organizing, for getting it together a little bit, feeling like you're not swirling in this madness of disorganization. And remember, if you fall off the wagon, so to speak, and you end up with 20 million dishes on the side of your sink, the tub is really dirty in your bathroom, the floor is dirty, you need to vacuum, this, that, and the other. I recommend start with the timer and just do five minutes in the kitchen and you'll feel better, probably, and it won't feel so overwhelming. When you look around at everything, it can feel a little bit like, well, I got to do this, I got to do that, I got to do this, I got to do that. Try to just focus on one thing, do it for five to ten minutes on a timer, and see how you feel. 
Because here's what I've noticed about the timer. You put it on for five minutes and then you get in a groove and that alarm goes off and instead of stopping it, you snooze it. And then you realize, oh, I can actually do this for another five minutes and maybe another five minutes. If you can't, that's fine. You did five minutes. That's better than nothing. And like I said, that ADHD energy will carry you through for five minutes in a way that you'll be surprised how much you can get done. So take those tips and let me know if any of you use them because I'd love to hear from anyone who is getting benefits from listening to this podcast and having it resonate with them. You can reach me at mybrainisawonderlandpod at gmail.com. You can find all of my social media handles in the show notes, but it's pretty much my brain is a wonderland everywhere on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. And I will see you again on my brain is a wonderland season two. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.